Hi everyone, uh, it's Dr. Wood. If you can hear me, go ahead and let me know. You know how it sounds. All right, perfect. These three of you can hear me. Uh, we'll get started in a few minutes. If you have any questions, feel free to post them up. I'm going to start by answering some of these about the exam for tomorrow, and then um, we will get started on the next topic. I think it's tomorrow, right? First exam. Yep, so I'm sure all of you are uh, pretty excited, a little bit of nervous excitement about it, but it should be should be fine, I think. I think it will be though. And if you do have questions, you can just post them up. Um, once I answer these, I'll probably take any questions for the exam tomorrow at the end, so that way I'm not sort of uh, breaking things up too much here. So our topics are pretty different from today versus on the exam for tomorrow. Hopefully everyone had a good restful weekend. No, no classes on Monday, so it must have been pretty good. My internet's been a little... Not iffy, but it's been a little uh, little inconsistent. Um, so if it goes down at all, then I can always, I'll be recording on my end. So worst comes to worst, I'll post uh, post something up, but um, or post the rest of the video up. But I think it will should hold out, just might have a few bits of stuttering here or there. All right, well, I'm gonna go ahead and start recording on my end. And uh, I'll get started here. Hopefully everyone is present and accounted for. Got about 23, so I'm sure I got a few stragglers in there. I know traffic can be pretty bad this time of morning, getting from your bed to your computer, but it is what it is. Um, looking at uh, a few questions I have here uh, pertaining to the test and some of the anticoagulant and antiplatelet drugs we talked about. Uh, one of them said about the slide pertaining to abseximab, it says that ASA and heparin are used together sometimes, but are those two being used with the abseximab or just on their own? A lot of that depends on the situation. You know, um, we'll get more into this in the cardiology section, but um, it depends on, you know, is the patient having a full-blown STEMI? Are they having an in STEMI? Are they going to the cath lab? Are they going to... Um, uh, you know, going to the OR to have a bypass done or something like that. So there's a lot of different situations there. Typically, a lot of those patients are going to get started off on aspirin at the very baseline, um, and then heparin as well, if there's any evidence of some kind of blockage or clot going on there. So those two for sure. And then you may even see the abseximab added on top of that. Um, what you end up finding is that when you're doing something like 
you know, going to the cath lab and having a PCI done, which is percutaneous coronary intervention, where they're actually snaking uh, a catheter up into the coronary vessels there. You don't want to cause additional clotting to occur because you're introducing this sort of foreign material into the body, which can have a tendency to um, trigger, you know, platelet activation, all of that. So by adding all these drugs together, using Epsiximab, using um, aspirin, using heparin together, you can help to prevent that. And so obviously the risk versus benefits, um, you have to take into account of like, you know, how likely are they to be bleeding and, and things like that. So, um, but they have protocols established for that sort of thing there. And a lot of it's like weight-based dosing and all of that to make sure that you don't over anticoagulate the patient and, and put them at risk for, for major bleeds. Is it still possible? For sure. But um, they try to mitigate that risk there. So. Um, someone said, hi there, can you briefly explain the difference between ADP receptor blockers and the uh, 2B3A blockers? Do they both inhibit fibrinogen binding to 2B3A? No, remember that um, ADP receptor blockers have their own specific receptors. There is a P2Y12 and two um, receptors. So they're blocking a different pathway there. When the platelets become activated, either through things like, well, you know, it's like an and or kind of thing, like thromboxane, um, through um, ADP, that activation is what uncovers the 2B3A receptors, and then that allows for fibrinogen to connect those together between different platelets. So the 2B3A receptor inhibitors are going to be blocking those spots specifically, but in order to prevent the platelet from even expressing those and even uh, being activated, that's where your like aspirin comes into play. That's where ADP receptor blockers come into play. So two different sites, which is why you can use those two together, right? That's why you can use um, two different classes of drugs together to get additional benefits there. But using a 2B3A blocker plus an ADP blocker like clopidogrel or ticagrelor or something like that. All right. And then uh, someone says, can you explain or re-explain the one-to-one -one ratio between factor 10 and 2 in regards to the mechanism of action of low molecular weight heparin? Yeah, so remember um, with heparin, it's helping to facilitate antithrombin 3 from binding to and inactivating some of those active clotting factors. So like 2 and 10 are by far the most important because those are part of the common pathway and those have a big uh, role to play in terms of like kind of propagating that positive feedback loop that happens when you're clotting. So they'll feed back. And, and further activate more of the intrinsic pathway and the extrinsic pathway as, a, as the case may be. So what happens is, is that two and 10 are affected, but also like nine, 11, and 12 as part of that intrinsic pathway, heparin will be affecting as well. But those are um, more minor clotting factors as opposed to 10 and two. So if like, you had to remember absolutely just two of them for heparin, I'd say definitely 10 and two, and it will affect those in a one-to-one -one sort of ratio. So it doesn't really have a preference for one versus the other. When you start to chop up that heparin molecule into some of the low molecular weight fragments, right, like enoxaparin is being sort of the best example there, you tend to uh, affect its preference for one versus the other. And as it gets shorter, it can't really help facilitate that binding between antithrombin 3 and factor 2 as well. Instead, it more focuses on factor 10. Um, I'm sorry, factor, yeah, factor 10. So it's almost like I think I uh, put like a five to one ratio or something like that. It's probably approximate. So as it gets shorter and shorter, it's going to be affecting more factor 10 than it is factor two. And then when you get into a Rixtra, if on the Paranux, that's just a five uh, saccharide molecule long. So that's extremely specific for just factor 10 and you get almost no two activity. Okay, so that's kind of what we're uh, mentioning there in terms of that. And remember, your monitoring is different too. So with like heparin, unfractionated heparin, um, I can use APTT in order to get a good idea of, um, you know, how long it's taking someone to have an actual clot uh, forming there. But with like, when I get into things like an oxaparin and like a fondaparinux, APTT doesn't really tell me all that much because uh, it's not really affecting, those drugs aren't affecting the intrinsic pathway nearly as much. Instead, um, they're mainly focusing on a common pathway with factor 10, uh, and so I need to use like anti-factor 10A levels. So some of the main differences, but uh, if you have more questions about the exam, feel free to post them up. Um, otherwise, um, I'm gonna continue on with the show here. So I'm gonna switch over. And you guys aren't the super, most talkative group in the bunch, but I'm assuming that's because it's eight o'clock in the morning, so I'm not gonna begrudge you that by any means. But of course, any questions, please ask them because uh, I'd rather you um, ask them and us at least get an answer for you and everyone else versus you holding back questions and then you, you know, feel like uh, you're kind of frustrated because you're not getting your questions answered. So feel free to ask them. I'm not going to make anyone feel silly or 
uh, not intelligent by asking a question because this is all new. Everyone's new to this stuff, so I don't expect anyone to have a mastery of this topic until probably 8 o'clock tomorrow when you're doing your exam. Anyway, let's get into uh, a pretty meaty topic here. We're going to be talking about antibiotics, and um, in order to start off with that, we have to kind of get a good eye overview of microbiology. I'm sure you've either had this before or you're going to be having it again uh, in some of your other classes here, but I want to go over some of the basics. Uh, in terms of how we classify our bacteria, there are uh, a couple of um, pretty large groups we can categorize these into in terms of our uh, bacteria. So uh, first off, easy enough is gram positive versus gram negative, right? So a lot of this has to do with the gram staining procedure here, which I'm not going to be quizzing you on specifically, but just know that when I talk about um, bugs and drugs, I'm talking about, you know, which type of bacteria does a particular drug treat. This is first off the one category we're going to talk about first. So we'll talk about whether they treat a gram positive bug versus a gram negative, right? And so these are some of the more common um, bacteria you're going to be finding in terms of causing disease in humans. Now, is this going to be an all exhaustive list? Absolutely not. I just want to talk about the common ones because these are going to come up over and over again, um, you know, as we cover different, you know, organ specific topics. Um, you know, we get into ENT, we get into um, derm, we get into all these different things. Here. You're going to see these pop up over and over again. So to start off with, and one other big delineation we're going to find with our bacteria, you know, is gram positive and negative. There's also anaerobes versus aerobes, right? So aerobes mean they require oxygen to live, which is going to be more common. Uh, anaerobes are going to be, uh, they do not require oxygen. In fact, exposure to oxygen is not good for them. Uh, those are less common, but they are um, important because where they pop up are specific to certain areas of the body, and I'll make mention of those. If I don't specify that it's an anaerobe, I'm talking about an aerobe, right? So just assume that that's your default there. Now, in terms of gram-positive bugs here, you know, some of these you've probably heard of before, things like Staph aureus, right? Um, you know, very common. We're going to find a lot of these gram-positives on the skin in a lot of cases, things like Staph epi. And Staph aureus, for sure, you're going to find colonized on just about every patient that you deal with. And so, for instance, here we can even have delineations of Staph aureus based off of some of its drug sensitivities. So if you ever hear of things like MSSA, that means methicillin-sensitive Staph aureus versus methicillin-resistant Staph aureus, right? Methicillin, as you might imagine, sounds a lot like penicillin. So that's by no accident. And so we'll see that that's um, a big delineation based off of whether it's going to be sensitive to a particular set of drugs or not. So we're going to look more at that in detail. You know, some of these things are important because they cause a lot of really resistant disease, which means that we don't have very many antibiotics to actually treat them. So someone who has an MRSA infection is going to be much different than someone who has an MSSA. My options are much more limited when you get into the more resistant bacteria. If you hear me say, um, there's certain buzzword bacteria that if you hear me talk about uh, that a drug treats it, you really want to know that because uh, it's important that you know that. And then two, I'm more likely to be asking you questions about that. MRSA is going to be one of those. Okay. So if you hear something has MRSA coverage, that's important to know because um, if someone comes in and they have an abscess or they have, um, you know, some other infection and you need to know what's high on your list of likely bacteria. And if MRSA is one of those bugs, then you got to know how to treat it, right? As I mentioned, Staph epi, you're going to find all over the skin, frequently causing uh, contamination of blood samples and things like that. But, you know, um, this will be a common one in some of your um, dermatologic infections and, and things like that. Um, yeah, so I, I put up an announcement, I think, and I updated the, the instructions on the prescription assignment. There's just there's just two of them, right? So just follow the instructions on um, the actual, you know, assignment there itself for the, the two prescriptions. The future ones you're going to have are three. So, um, yeah, so just do the two there. So don't worry about that. Um, next up, we have strep pneumo. That's going to be really important for a variety of upper respiratory tract infections, so things like um, otitis media and uh, bacterial sinusitis. We'll talk more about that later on. And then we have the enterococci, which are, as you might imagine, in the GI tract. So enterococcus faecalis and fascium, these can be important for certain um, either intra-abdominal infections or sometimes like UTIs and, and things like that. In terms of anaerobes, um, these become important, especially when you're dealing with like, um, you know, uh, bite infections. So for instance, if you have someone who gets bitten by like a dog or a human, uh, sometimes you can actually have anaerobes being in, um, 
you know, kind of put into those wounds there through the mouth, right? So things like peptococcus and peptostreptococcus are big ones there. Um, but then we also have some of these bacilli, things like Clostridium difficile, right? So if you've heard of C. diff before, this is where this becomes really important. Um, this is a common opportunistic pathogen uh, that will pop up as a result of use of antibiotics. So this happens because when you're taking antibiotics, you can have a tendency to um, disrupt the normal gut flora, and that leaves an opportunity for C. diff to come in and start to uh, colonize. And that can lead to some very severe diarrheas and, and things like you know pseudomembranous colitis and, and things like that. So pretty nasty bug here. C. diff will be another one of those buzzword bacteria that if you hear that and something treats that, you definitely want to know that as well. So we'll talk about MRSA, C. diff. Not to mean that you don't need to be able to recognize these other bacteria, but these are going to be... Um, you know, we're going to find that uh, we have a lot of drugs to treat a lot of these other ones. Um, but if you hear something like C. diff, like we only have like two or three drugs to actually treat that, right? So that's why you want to keep it in the back of your mind. Uh, next, we have our gram negative bacilli. This is where we're going to have a, a ton of different bacteria here, things like Enterobacteriaceae, things like, you know, E. coli and Klebsiella. You're going to find a lot of these causing um, GI infections. You're going to find these causing a lot of UTIs. Um, and then, you know, depending on the case there, maybe even things like pneumonias and, and whatnot. Um, in terms of notable bacteria here, um, another one sort of on the same uh, category or same sort of echelon as MRSA in terms of causing disease is going to be things like uh, Pseudomonas aeruginosa. If you hear Pseudomonas, that's another one I want you to know pretty well. Uh, because if you have someone who is uh, having a high likelihood of having a Pseudomonal infection, they tend to get really sick pretty quick. Um, and what you're going to find with the gram-negative bugs, too, is they like to share resistance with one another. So, uh, for instance, you could have pseudomonas develop an enzyme that cleaves a certain type of bacteria, and then they will then uh, be able to send that a little plasmid with that DNA over to another gram-negative, and all of a sudden then they are now going to be resistant to your drug, right? So that's a really um, uh, set of nasty bacteria here that you would want to be familiar with. Um, you know, some of the other ones are more likely to happen in maybe patients with like a compromised immuno, uh, uh, immune system, you know, if they have like, you know, cancer treatment, um, if they have, you know, more progressive HIV, AIDS, you know, that sort of thing there. So you won't find things like Stenotrophomonas and Acinetobacter is commonly, but if you have someone with a compromised immune system, that's where they're more likely to show up there. And then some of the common things you'll see for certain um, STIs and like upper respiratory tract infections, you know, H. influenza, Morxalic cateralis, Neisseria, things like that are going to pop up there. And then if we have uh, some bacteria that don't really um, follow the gram staining sort of process uh, well, we call these atypical bugs. They're not really gram positives or negatives. Um, this is where we can see things like chlamydia pop up here, and then a couple of bugs that are notable for causing um, a lot of uh, respiratory tract infections, things like Legionella pneumonia, which is um, you know, causes Legionnaire's disease. You know, if you ever hear a case uh, study question um, where they ask about, you know, there was a, a hotel and there was a contaminated um, AC unit, like you always think that's Legionella, it's always gonna be the case there, uh, and the mycoplasma pneumonia. These are important too. When I say something covers atypical bugs, these are what I'm talking about. And these are important too because there's a relatively small subset of drugs that are going to be able to treat these as well. Okay. So, um, in terms of what I'm going to be asking you on a test, you know, I'm going to ask you in general about how drugs, like what their spectrum of treatment is. And when I mean that spectrum, what I'm talking about is what group of bacteria are they likely to treat? And you're going to find that based off the disease state you're dealing with, that you can come up with a list of very likely bacteria to be causing disease for that particular patient. So what I mean by that is if you have someone who comes in with an abscess, right? So they have, uh, you know, this uh, skin infection that's developed this nice little pocket uh, of pus there. Um, you're going to come up with a differential of like likely bacteria. And you're going to think like, okay, well, this is on the skin. What grows on the skin? Well, it's a lot of things like, you know, Staph aureus and Staph epi and things like that. Based off of that differential of bacteria, you are then going to be able to come up with a list of drugs that are very likely to treat that, such that the list of drugs I'm likely to use to treat a skin and soft tissue infection may be very different than the list of drugs I'm likely to use for something like a UTI or something like uh, a perforated appendicitis and things like that. That's based off of the location of the infection and the most likely bacteria to cause disease there, right? So am I going to ask you specifically, you know, which of these bacteria is most likely to cause infection in the bones? Well, no, I'm probably not for my test, but when we start to talk about ortho stuff, 
I want you to be able to recognize, okay, well, I'm thinking like ortho infections, you know, maybe someone had a hip replacement and maybe during surgery, some bacteria got in there. Well, it's likely to get in there. Well, probably skin stuff, right? So you'll get a feel for this over time and have a good idea of the most likely bacteria to cause infection of these uh, disease states. And when I get into specific topics like pneumonia, for instance, um, we're gonna cover that again. And then that'll be important when I'd ask you what's first line treatment for pneumonia? You know, what's first, uh, second line treatment? What's uh, the treatment if someone has a penicillin allergy? Those are the things we're gonna get into later on there, okay? Um, in the abdomen, you're gonna find a lot of gram negative bugs, but also because in the abdomen, um, it's more of an anaerobic environment, you're gonna see a lot of things like uh, uh, anaerobic bacteria, like Bacteroides fragilis, or like C. diff can pop up there. They've recently had antibiotics, things like that. You know, um, UTIs, typically are gonna be gram negative bugs, which makes sense because anatomically, what's close to the urinary tract, well, the GI tract too, right? And, and again, you know, depending on the patient's anatomy, for instance, like female patients typically are more prone to UTIs because of just the, the anatomy that there's a little uh, less distance between the urinary tract to the GI tract there. But also consider things like, well, what if a patient has like an indwelling catheter, right? Anytime you have foreign material going into a patient, whether it's an IV line, whether it's uh, an endotracheal tube, whether it's a urinary catheter, um, those all predispose patients to infection because bacteria can bind onto that foreign material and then travel on up and in, into the body. So that can change your spectrum of bacteria such that maybe someone's more likely to have a Staph aureus UTI, they have a history of uh, you know indwelling catheter versus someone who did not, they'd be much less likely to have that, okay? So anyway, these are things you're going to feel for um, over time. Sometimes there's overlap, for instance, like between the upper and the res uh, lower respiratory tract here, you can see a lot of the same bacteria causing both infections here, which makes sense because they can travel from the upper to the lower respiratory tract, makes sense. And then also think about things like nosocomial infections, right? These are things that we give the patients as a result of them being in contact with healthcare, the healthcare environment, either healthcare practitioners or just being in the hospital. And so this is important here because this really increases your risk for things like MRSA and pseudomonas, some of those really resistant bacteria that are more difficult to treat, make patients sicker. Um, and so this is why we want to be having these sort of um, in the back of our mind. We want to think about these and when we recognize the risk patients infected with these, we've got to be able to make sure we're treating them uh, with the appropriate um, uh, drugs. So anyway, so how do we know if something is like resistant or um, if a drug is, if a bacteria is susceptible to a particular drug here, how do we figure that out? Um, and so this is where we have a variety of lab tests. And you as a practitioner, what you're going to be doing is not necessarily running these tests here. You're not going to actually be dropping um, disc of antibiotic into these agar plates here after you've cultured out the bacteria. This is what the lab's doing. But this is what happens when you order a culture from a patient, whether it be uh, a urine culture or um, you know a bronchial alveolar lavage culture, things like that. What you're gonna find is the lab will then grow out the bacteria onto these plates here. And then what we can do is introduce um, different antibiotics. And then based off of how well they prevent that bacteria from growing, will tell us how likely it is that drug is gonna work on that particular bacteria, right? So, and that's usually reported out as either um, the bug is susceptible to the drug, which is good. We want them to be susceptible. It can be intermediate or it can be resistant. Those are the typical things you're gonna see reported out on your, um, your cultures, right, when you get those back. And so, for instance, here, this is what we call a disc diffusion test on the left here. This is where you can actually drop uh, varying antibiotics here. So you can see these are all different antibiotics they are dropping into the plate. And based off of how big of the zone of inhibition they're getting, that can tell you how well that drug is gonna work on that bacteria. So for instance, you can see here, like this one, this drug here is probably pretty good because there's no bacteria really growing around it in a large distance versus something like this one here. This would be considered resistant. It's not doing anything to those bacteria. And so because of that, I'd much rather use a drug like this versus this one here, okay? So that's one way to do it. There's also another way we can actually specifically have like a stick test here, it's called an e-test, and they actually have varying concentrations of the antibiotic along the different um, portions here of the stick. And as you go up, we have higher concentrations. You see that the zone of inhibition gets bigger. This is important because it tells us how high of a concentration we have to get in the body in order to treat the bacteria. So a really important concept here I'll mention, it's called the minimum inhibitory concentration. 
That's the minimum level you have to achieve with the antibiotic in order to prevent the bacteria from growing. So if you hear me talk about MIC, or minimum inhibitory concentration, that's what I'm referring to. And so basically, you know, with um, any particular drug, I can drive the concentrations up higher and higher and higher, and eventually, I'm probably gonna be able to start preventing the bacteria from growing, but if the concentrations have to be so high that it ends up harming the patient, then that's not great, right? So I have to be able to kind of um, weigh the benefits of being able to kill that bacteria, but also against the toxicities of what that drug might be doing to the patient, right? So that's always gonna be the, the thing there between um, you know driving the, for higher concentrations, bigger doses, but you're more likely to cause harm in the patient, which is not good. So anyway, so that brings us to our next section here of talking about um, principles of antibiotic selection. Uh, when I talk about spectrum of activity, that is referring to the different types of uh, bacteria that a given drug will work on. So something like penicillin is gonna work on a different set of drugs than something, um, for instance, like gentamicin or vancomycin, right? They're gonna find that the spectrum of activity is important to know, such that you know I'm not gonna be using you know, a particular drug for a disease state that it just doesn't work for, right? Because it's very unlikely to treat the bacteria that are likely to be causing disease for that particular patient. That's important to know. Um, then we're gonna talk about the kinetics where this is important in terms of like how it gets absorbed, whether or not it gets absorbed via different routes. Um, does it distribute to the body compartments I care about? So for instance, if I have a patient with meningitis that's in the CNS, and it's very difficult for a back or for an antibiotic to cross the blood brain barrier, if it doesn't cross at all, then it's never gonna treat that, that meningitis. It's not a very good drug for that particular indication there. And then elimination is gonna be really important. Um, we'll talk about renal elimination uh, and how this uh, makes a difference in terms of how you're dosing your, your medications there. Some of these drugs have narrow therapeutic indices um, such that we have to do things like therapeutic drug monitoring on, Right, so we remember talking about using drug levels in order to help guide us and picking um, dosing regimens such that we get levels that are high enough to kill the bacteria, but also not so high they're gonna start harming the patient, right? So those are the kinetic principles we'll look at. In terms of the pharmacodynamics, this is where you wanna to start to consider things about how the bacteria is gonna be interacting with the drug itself. So in the case here, we'll talk about things either being bactericidal versus bacteriostatic, meaning whether it kills the bacteria directly or whether it just inhibits it prevents them from growing. We're gonna talk about time dependent killing versus concentration dependent. So we'll get into that in just a few moments here. And then obviously the other big thing to know about these drugs are what type of toxicities can you expect, right? Um, what are some of these things that we may not, may lead us to not choosing a certain drug for a patient because of the risk for causing further toxicity here. So uh, for instance, someone with poor kidney function, maybe avoiding a drug that has a risk for causing worsened kidney function, right? Sometimes you can get around this by choosing a different drug. Sometimes you can mitigate this by um, using therapeutic drug monitoring. Sometimes you gotta take the good with the bad and just know that there's a risk you're gonna be causing that harm in the patient, but it's gonna be outweighed by the benefits of treating that infection and keeping your patient alive, for instance. So when we're looking at uh, bactericidal versus bacteriostatic, here's a general overview of the different drug classes and how they're going to be either categorize the bactericidal or bacteriostatic. The reason why I care about this is because in cases of, you know, when you're treating an infection, it's not just the bacteria and the antibiotic that are interacting with one another. It's also the host immune system, right? So um, we can use drugs, for instance, like clindamycin, to try to inhibit the bacteria from actively replicating, and then that gives our immune system time to come in and use our neutrophils and all that to try to gobble up those bacteria and deal with the infection, which is all well and good. So these, you know, there's certainly good uses for bacteriostatic antibiotics. But in some cases, you may want something with a little bit stronger action. So for instance, if we use something bactericidal, it will directly kill the bacteria, either by disrupting its cell membrane or some other reason, some other mechanism. And this is important too, because what if I have a patient with a, uh, maybe a compromised immune system? You know, what if they have, um, they just received cancer treatment and when we, they received drugs that wiped out their white blood cells? Well, then we don't really have the benefit of the host immune system to help us out. And so this is where it may be more beneficial to use um, antibiotics that directly kill those bacteria. So, and sometimes you may see these used in combination. Sometimes it doesn't matter which one you use, but just know that in tip, uh, in general, um, some with a weakened immune system will benefit more from a bactericidal antibiotic because they can directly go and kill those bacteria, okay? 
So another concept here, which can be a little um, challenging for students sometimes, I'll show you a graph here, which makes more sense, is this idea of concentration versus time dependent killing. And so what I mean by that is when I say something is a concentration dependent killer, the main takeaway is, is that the higher the drug concentration gets, the greater the killing, okay? And you say, well, wait a second, what if you drive the concentration up so high it costs toxicity? We'll talk about that, but there's gonna be a balance that can be struck here. Um, but in general, you wanna get high concentrations of the drug to kill off more of the bacteria. Even if you drop, even if the levels drop down below where it would normally be able to inhibit the bacteria, they have what they call the post-antibiotic effect. This is gonna be a case here where you kind of shock the, the bacteria with so much drug that it's started to kill them off. And even if the levels of drug go down to almost zero, they're still getting good anti, um, antibacterial effects, still killing all those bacteria because of this post-antibiotic effect, okay? On the other hand, we have time-dependent antibiotics, which are gonna be drugs that have to remain above the MIC for as long as possible. The longer they're above the MIC, the longer they're gonna be actively killing those bacteria, which means that um, we need to use a dosing strategy that keeps the levels of the antibiotic above that MIC for as long as possible. What that means is that the dosing between these two are quite different. For the case of concentration-dependent killers, I can give one really big dose one time a day and get really good antibacterial effect versus time-dependent killers. I have to give multiple times a day in order to make sure the levels stay above that MIC, okay? So what that looks like, and again, if you're looking at this left uh, most curve here, you can drug concentration on the y-axis here, time on the x-axis. And then what you can see is you can plot out the drug levels in the body after a single dose of an antibiotic here, right? And so one of the terms we'll use occasion is called AUC. And actually um, there's a reading this week that I'd like you to check out. There's no discussion board questions or um, you know quiz questions on it specifically, but um, it's just another way to explain a lot of these more difficult concepts. Um, Cause again, hearing it via two different you know voices, um, two different authors may be useful in case I don't explain something completely uh, well to your mind, maybe you can read another source there. So check that out, pretty quick and dirty guide to using um, antibiotics. But anyway, a, a term you'll see used is called the AUC or the area under the curve, which is basically the amount of time um, that the, uh, the antibiotic levels are above that MIC there, which you can see. So time above MIC is really important for time dependent killers versus looking at the total um, peak concentration here is gonna be important for the concentration dependent killers. And when I say MIC, you can actually kind of plot this out if you were to look at, uh, say, various test tubes with the bacteria in it, and then you were to apply higher and higher concentrations of the drug. The point in which you are not seeing any more bacterial growth here is called the MIC. It's that minimum inhibitory concentration. You can plot that out here on this curve as well, which you can see. And so basically, if I have a time-dependent killer, such as a beta-lactam antibiotic, which that'll make more sense here in a few moments, you wanna keep as much time above that MIC as possible. So if you were to look at, for instance, um, a dosing strategy, which I have my uh, handy dandy artwork here, which I'm gonna be using. So imagine you're looking at drug concentration on the x-axis and then again, time on the, uh, I'm sorry, uh, time on the x-axis and drug concentration on the y-axis here. And you would imagine the MIC being this line right here. What we'd wanna do, with our drug levels and drug dosing is we'd give a single dose here, right? Drug levels get to a certain peak. And then as the levels start to drop down, right before you get down below the MIC, you can give another dose, right? So that level will spike up and then you'll get this nice pattern here where if I'm giving it say every eight hours or every six hours, for instance here, you're keeping it consistently above the MIC, which allows for consistent kill of those bacteria versus if I was to use something like a um, concentration dependent killer, when we're shooting for getting one really high level and then having it drop down below. And then uh, and honestly, in, in some cases there, you're giving the drug Q24 hours, you may find that you have a level of zero before the next day when you give that next dose. And that's totally okay because the concentration dependent killers have what we call that post antibiotic effect, okay? So very different dosing strategies between these two. If I were to give something like a penicillin every 24 hours, it just wouldn't work for the patient because if, going back to that red line here with the time dependent killer, if I were to give this just as a single dose and then have it drop down below the MIC, it's not gonna do anything for the bacteria that's gonna keep growing and the patient's not gonna get any better, right? So that's some of the big differences you're gonna see there. Getting back into um, some of the categories we're gonna look at, um, frequently the way you're gonna be able to break down these back, uh, antibiotics are gonna be based off their mechanism of action. 
and that's generally how we're going to be categorizing these. So um, refer back to this in order to sort of group these in your mind in terms of how they're going to be working. And this will be important for being able to recognize different antibiotics and what classes they fit into. And then once you know what class a drug belongs to, then you can start to um, categorize a lot of different information about it. So like what are the common adverse effects? What are the common drug interactions and things like that? So it's helpful if you can identify a particular drug, put it into that group, and then you can know a lot of things about that group, okay? As opposed to memorizing every detail about every drug, you gotta be able to categorize this stuff, right? And so this is where this can become really important. So anyway, without further ado, let's get into the actual drugs in themselves, because this is what you come to class for, right? So starting off first, we're gonna have our beta-lactam antibiotics. And so when I say a beta-lactam antibiotic, this is gonna to apply to a wide range of different antibiotics here, but they all share the similar beta-lactam structure, right? So this is called a beta-lactam ring, this four ring system here. This is the business end of the antibiotic. This is what's actually gonna be killing the bacteria. And so what's different between all these different agents, whether it's a carbapenem, a cephalosporin, a penicillin, is gonna be all this stuff off to either side of the beta-lactam ring, okay? But they all share that similar activity in terms of how they're gonna be working. The mechanism is identical between all these different drugs. So it's a pretty broad category we're gonna be talking about here. And so why do these work? Why does this beta-lactam ring work on antibiotics? Well, it kind of mimics the look of two D-alanines, right? And so you can kind of see two D-alanines here together. You can imagine how they sort of look a little similar to uh, the bacteria, or if you're not good at imagination, just say, yeah, it, it looks enough like that. The reason why this matters is because it's able to bind to what they call penicillin binding protein. And so obviously, bacteria didn't call it that, but you know, penicillin was the first thing that we found that bound to this protein, so we call it penicillin binding protein. Penicillin binding protein is really important because it helps to uh, form the cell wall within a bacteria. It actually forms all of the cross links between the various layers of it, and it and helps to have a nice, uh, strong integrity, or a, a wall, a cell wall that has good, strong integrity to it, cell membrane. So what happens is, is if I have something like a penicillin come and bind that penicillin binding protein and cause a covalent link here to form, this is permanent, rendering this uh, penicillin binding protein inactive unless it cannot continue to grow that cell wall, right? So what happens, if, well, if you can't form these crosslinks here, the integrity of this wall is gonna go down. So what happens is you end up causing sort of a, a hole to, to form in various places in the cell wall because that penicillin binding protein is not working. And as you cause these holes to form, stuff can just start to leak out. And as you might imagine, if stuff was leaking out of you, you would not be able to survive for so long. And so you can see that the bacteria will eventually die off, right? Eventually so much damage is done to the cell, it just triggers off apoptosis, and then you just say, all right, I'm out of here, right? I'm done. So as you might imagine, all of the beta-lactam antibiotics are gonna be bactericidal because they're directly causing disruption of that cell membrane, okay? So that's a really important concept to get down is how these drugs are actually working. And then if you're thinking about what if I need two drugs to use at the same time, you wanna make sure you're using complementary mechanisms. So if I have two drugs that are going through the same mechanism, two different ones working on the same penicillin binding protein, that doesn't make any sense, right? You wanna make sure we're using complementary mechanisms. And I'll give you some examples of that a little bit later on of ways we can combine these that make sense here, okay? But anyway, so disrupting the cell wall, causing disruptions here, less integrity, thus the cell is gonna to start to leak out contents and then die, okay? So getting out into some different categories here, we're gonna start with the penicillins first and then work our way through the rest of the beta-lactam antibiotics. Again, all these ones I'm talking about here are beta-lactams, meaning they all share the same mechanism. Now when I get into these antibiotics here, I'm gonna use the stoplight uh, sort of analogy here. Obviously yellow means use with caution, may have some situational uses. Gram-negative means it's generally not gonna work all that well for gram-negative bacteria. And then gram-positives, uh, green means, yeah, you're good to use it, right? So um, when I'm asking you questions here on these uh, antibiotics, I'm not gonna ask you specifically about drugs of choice for things. That will be more important when we get into specific topics like ENT, pulmonology, things like that, when I'm asking you specifically about pneumonias and whatnot. I'm simply providing you this information here to give you some context for ways we might use these drugs, um, common things you're gonna see being used for. I'm not gonna ask you specific indications based off of this particular PowerPoint, um, nor am I going to ask you specific bacteria that it covers. I'm gonna ask you more broadly speaking type of coverage questions, right? Whether it covers anaerobes or not, whether it gets good gram positive coverage or not. 
The exceptions to that are going to be those kind of buzzword and uh, bacteria that I talked about. Things like, does it cover MRSA? Does it cover Pseudomonas? Does it cover C. diff? Those are things I want you to kind of um, have more specific focus on. But more broadly, does this drug cover atypical bacteria? Yes or no. Does it cover anaerobes? Yes or no. Does it cover gram positive? Those are going to be more broad questions you may see on a test. I'll give you some examples of those a little bit later on. Now, again, this is penicillin G. This is the one that's been around uh, forever. This is the first antibiotic we really discovered, um, and we still get some use out of it. It's fairly narrow in spectrum of what it's working for, as you can see with this kind of stoplight uh, analogy here, but we can still use it for things like syphilis pretty commonly, um, but it doesn't work for a wide range of things. So this is pretty narrow in spectrum. So if, I hear talk, uh, if you hear me talk about narrow spectrum antibiotic, this is an example of that. Very few things that it works on, but where it works, it works pretty well, okay? And again, all of the penicillins here we're going to be looking at, and in fact, all of the beta-lactam antibiotics we're looking at are all going to be time-dependent killers. So when you see things like giving every four hours, that's why you have to do it that way, because if I gave it every 24 hours, that level would drop down to nothing pretty quickly, and then you'd see that the bacteria are not going to be inhibited at all. Okay. Uh, similarly, I'm not going to ask you specific dosing questions, but when you see things like why is a drug dose every 24 hours versus every four hours, I want you to have sort of an um, uh, an idea of why that is, right, based off of the kinetics and the dynamics of the drug there. So those are things I want you to kind of key in on. I don't care that you know the specific dosing. You can look that stuff up, right? So now um, penicillin G was okay, but it's only available IV, and if you try to give it orally, it actually gets destroyed in the GI tract. So we have a few varieties of um, penicillin that we can use as an alternative. For, so for instance, we have penicillin VK or V-potassium, this is actually stable in the GI tract. So this is the oral form you're going to see here. Um, penicillin G, as I mentioned, is the IV formulation. And this is actually an interesting one here called penicillin G benzathine. Um, this is actually, if you look here, this is an example of penicillin G benzathine, or bicillin is the brand name. And you're going to see here that it has this kind of white milk. It looks like it's milk you're injecting into the patient. That's actually an oil-based emulsion that the drug is in. The benefit of doing this, and when you give it into the muscle, you never want to do this IV because that emulsion is not going to go into solution very well with the blood and cause emboli and things like that. But when given into the muscle, it provides for kind of long-acting release of the drug over a period of, you know, a week or two. And so the benefit of that is, is if I have like a kid who's in the ER who's not able to take oral medications, sometimes I can give this as a one-time dose as an alternative, and that way they don't have to come back and get more medication than IV. They don't have to take anything orally. Just that one-time dose. <clears throat> Pretty... Um, narrow in terms of the indications that we can use that for, but where it does work, it works pretty well. So you can may see that occasionally. So that was natural penicillin. Then we can step it up. Now we have kind of the next um, variety of penicillins here called the amino penicillins. There's two in this category called ampicillin, and then we have amoxicillin. Um, similar, I'm not going to ask you specifically, um, you know, whether a drug is available IV or PO. Um, I'm just putting it here so that we kind of get an idea of kind of the common ways these come. Um, for instance, like amoxicillin PO, like that's just a bread and butter antibiotic you're going to be using all the time in pediatrics and urgent care, family practice, you're going to see all the time. So what are some of the benefits of using amino penicillin versus strict penicillin? Well, you end up seeing um, a little bit better anaerobic activity here. You end up seeing still a decent coverage against gram positive bugs, but no staph coverage, right? We still haven't seen anything that really covers Staph aureus uh, just yet. We're going to get into that in just a little bit, though. Um, but what, in general, what you see is that the amino penicillins are really good for a lot of like upper respiratory tract stuff. So like you know sinusitis, otitis media. It's also pretty good for things like community acquired pneumonia. So that's where we're going to see this come up again and again, and we'll see that as we get into like ENT and whatnot a little bit later on there. So pretty good drugs, but they are somewhat limited in activity. So this is like, you know, moxicillin is a pretty good um, beginner drug to use for someone like, you know, if I have a kid with otitis media and give amoxicillin to them and it works most of the time. But sometimes I have to step up my game a little bit, right? And so we'll talk about some ways we can do that in just a moment. Another thing I want to mention here are some of the interactions to think about, and this kind of applies to um, most antibiotics that are going to be disrupting the gut flora to, to some degree. Now, um, I'm not sure if I said gut flora all of a sudden. Uh, gut flora is what I meant to say. But what I'm talking about here is anytime an antibiotic disrupts gut flora, you can see some interactions that happen here. So, for instance, one of the things you can find um, as a result of mixing antibiotics with um, other drugs is, for instance, anticoagulants. It can be a problem. 
one of the big places we get a lot of the vitamin K that gets absorbed from the GI tract is from the gut bacteria. And if you disrupt that with an antibiotic, then you have less vitamin K being absorbed. And as you know, for tomorrow especially, that can affect things like warfarin. That can actually lead you to have an increased bleeding time, which can be a significant interaction there. Um, also, there is some risk that there is a decrease in effectiveness of oral contraceptives. The reason for that is, is that normally estrogen is used to help suppress the, um, the ovulation cycle or the menstrual cycle. And so um, one of the things you see with estrogen, it actually undergoes what they call enterohepatic recirculation, meaning that it gets uh, eliminated through the uh, biliary tract through the liver and it gets reabsorbed from the GI tract. And the way that happens is through the gut flora processing the estrogen in the GI tract. If you get rid of that flora, then you can't reprocess the estrogen and reabsorb it, and so it actually shortens the half-life. And so there is some risk, some theoretical risk, that um, by giving antibiotics at the same time someone's receiving oral contraception, if they're not using backup protection, that it could increase their risk for ovulating and then having a pregnancy occur. So, um, you know, there's no clinical trials that actually demonstrate this because it's not really ethical to, you know, give people antibiotics and birth control and see who gets pregnant and who doesn't because that's kind of a at least an 18-year commitment you're dealing with. Um, so it's one of those things where, like, you know, is there a lot of risk from telling them to use backup contraception? Probably not. You know, so is it a bad idea to tell them? Probably not. You know, so it is what it is, right? Uh, some other things to watch out for, and this kind of applies to the majority of penicillins here. Um, you know, risk for hepatic dysfunction, it's pretty low, but it can happen. Um, C. difficile infections, the more anaerobic activity a bacteria, uh, an antibiotic has, the more likely are to see C. diff infection, okay? So it doesn't mean I receive one dose of uh, amoxicillin, I'm going to get C. diff, but the more antibiotics are on, the stronger the anti-anaerobic uh, effect is, uh, the more the risk there is for C. diff to occur, so be aware of that. Another thing here is called Stevens and Johnson syndrome and toxic epidermal necrolysis. It's kind of um, you know, a continuation of the same disease state with uh, TEN. Basically, though, um, this is a, a severe reaction that people can have to certain medications. Some medications are more likely to cause it than others, but uh, there's some risk here with the uh, penicillins. And this includes basically a reaction where um, skin tissue starts to break down. You start to see things like oral ulcerations. You can start to see blisters, rash. The skin can actually just start to slough off in sheets. It can be very deadly if not caught and sort of treated pretty aggressively early on, um, including stopping taking the medication altogether. So very low risk, but you still want to tell your patients about it. Say, hey, if you notice any new rashes, blisters, anything like that, Stop taking the medication, give us a call, and we can see what to do about it. Okay, so just know that. We'll talk more about that and some other drugs that are more likely to cause that. Also, um, some risk for kidney injury. Most of the beta lactams we're going to talk about, with uh, a few notable exceptions, are going to be renally eliminated, meaning you have to watch the kidney function, make sure they can clear it. Otherwise, you're going to see levels start to build up. And that's going to lead to even more toxicity here, right? Um, some risk for things like, you know, blood dyscrasias, like anemia, thrombocytopenia, unlikely to occur though, especially if you're giving really limited courses of the drug. So like, you know, five days, seven days, 10 days, probably not going to be able to see that. Okay. Now, in terms of when I mentioned contraindications, it's good to be able to delineate between absolute versus relative. Remember, absolute means that type of patient's never going to get the drug. Relative means that maybe I'm just going to be monitoring more closely. So for instance, if they have a history of a true anaphylactic allergy to penicillin, I'm not going to re-challenge it. I'm not going to give that to them again because uh, the risk for anaphylaxis is already pretty high. Okay. On the other hand, though, if I had someone who had a history of maybe hepatic dysfunction, but now their hepatic function has recovered, then I'm, I can monitor that. I can look at their LFTs, but I know that it's, you know, I'm probably okay to still use the penicillin. I'm just going to be more careful, right? So be able to kind of delineate uh, between those, and I'll kind of be able to talk about that more as we get into some of these other cases. So remember, watch the renal function. Typically what's going to happen here with um, penicillins or really any of these renally eliminate antibiotics, we can alter the levels by trying to change how often we're going to give the drug here, right? And so to give an example of what that looks like, if I was to go back here and, and do some more uh, artwork, we have a... Another example, so if we're looking at drug levels, you know, again, concentrations on the y-axis here, and you have time on the x-axis. Uh, imagine if I were to dose a medication, um, you know, you see normally you could dose it. And then remember, we talked about steady state. We talked about how you can get after four to five half-lives. And I'm saying, you know, can someone get to steady state? So you get pretty consistent levels here, right? What happens is someone ends up having 
renal dysfunction, what can end up happening is that they end up not being able to clear that as well. And so levels will start to go up, but then, you know, it's kind of going down pretty slow. And then they get the next dose and then they get the next dose. And so they're just not clearing as well. So levels get higher and higher and that predispose you to toxicity from occurring. So what I can do instead for that type of patient is I can go ahead and use a different dosing strategy where I'm giving a dose and you know, it's not going down as quickly, but then I'm waiting longer to give the next dose. And then I can get it again. And then again, it's taking a while to clear it out. But I'm, see, I'm giving the dose less frequently. So as opposed to giving a dose here, 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 and here, instead I'm only giving it here, here, and then here. So by switching from something like Q, eight hour dosing to Q, 12 hour dosing, I give the body more time to clear it. And thus I uh, don't accumulate those same high levels as you would see if I was using more aggressive dosing intervals. Okay. So frequently that's what you're going to see is it will try to decrease um, how often we're giving it and going from every eight hours to 12 or from 12 to 24 or something like that. I want to give the body more time to clear it. Okay. So um, other things to note here too, again, watch out for hypersensitivity reactions, rash, you know, rash could be signs of Stevens Johnson's, not likely, but you know, uh, mild rash can happen in some patients. And then again, for, in terms of monitoring, look for renal function, hepatic function, things like that. So as I mentioned, you know, um, you can find that bacteria do have some natural resistance in some cases to the beta-lactams, and it has that through something called beta-lactamase. A lactamase is an enzyme that the bacteria can produce to directly cleave this ring. And once that happens, the antibiotic is no good anymore. It's basically inactivated. It's not going to do anything. And so what we can do in those cases there is to give something that actually inhibits beta lactamase. So if you ever hear the term beta lactamase inhibitor, that's what I'm referring to. And so these are drugs that have no direct activity against the bacteria, but they help to um, inactivate beta lactamase. And that allows the drug itself to be more active. And so we can see that there's three main uh, ones we're going to run into, including Solbactam, which is frequently found along with ampicillin, that's called Unison. There's Tazobactam, which is found with Piperacillin, which we'll talk about in a few moments, that's called Zosin. And then there's Clavulanate or Clavulonic Acid. And this is in combination with Amoxicillin, that's where we get to Augmentin. And most of you probably heard of Augmentin uh, before. If you worked in a hospital before, you've probably seen Zosin used uh, with some regularity. So what does that do for us? Well, it actually helps out quite a bit in terms of helping out with the anaerobic coverage. And also too, if someone has a history of like maybe uh, having a bug resistant to amoxicillin, frequently by adding that beta-lactamase inhibitor, you can overcome that resistance. Um, so if I had someone who had like an otitis media um, that was not getting better after being treated with amoxicillin, I can step it up and use amoxicillin clavulanate, which is augmentin, and frequently that would end up treating the infection. So again, that's not every case, but it's a lot of cases. So amino penicillins plus beta-lactamase inhibitors, that's where we got augmentin and then unison. Now it has better anaerobic coverage, including things like in, um, gut anaerobes like, you know, bacteroides. Um, also, you start to see now it covers MSSA, right? So now I can start to use it for more like skin infections, for instance, uh, that may be uh, caused by MSSA. No MRSA coverage though, right? And so we see we use this all the time. These are kind of workhorse antibiotics, just like amoxicillin plain is very commonly used antibiotics here. We use it for a lot of skin and soft tissue infections. You can use it for things like diabetic foot, which is, um, you know, if you imagine someone with diabetes, they have poor circulation, they have, um, you know, uh, neuropathies that happen in the feet. It's common for them to get infections there. And when it's, you know, surrounded by a sock and a shoe, it's an anaerobic environment. So it's common to see a lot of uh, anaerobes there growing. So you can use it for that. And then a lot of like bite injuries, so like human bites and animal bites and, and whatnot. So then we have a, a more narrow sort of spectrum of activity penicillin here, but these were the first ones that we came up with that actually had activity against um, Staph aureus. And so these are called the anti-staphylococcal penicillins. When you hear methicillin sensitive or methicillin resistant Staph aureus, this is where methicillin fit into. We, don't, we no longer use methicillin, but we still use that nomenclature. And so we have three that fit into this category called mafcillin, oxacillin, and dicloxacillin very narrow spectrum of activity. Really the only thing we're ever gonna use it for is MSSA. So this is something to where um, de-escalation strategies are really important. And what I mean by that is that frequently if someone's coming in with an infection, whether it's a pneumonia or uh, you know bacteremia, anything like that, frequently we're gonna use what we call empiric therapy. Empiric therapy means we don't know specifically what bacteria the patient has, but we have a pretty good idea of the common bacteria that could be causing the disease. And then we're gonna uh, start get the cultures, start the antibiotics, 
right? Treating for a lot of things we probably, the patient probably doesn't have. And then once the cultures come back and we have an identity of the bacteria causing disease, then we can then scale down our therapy to something more narrow spectrum. So you generally go from broad spectrum to narrow spectrum, right? Once you know what it is. And so this is where de-escalation comes into that, with that uh, going to the narrow spectrum drug. So for instance, if I have someone who is treating for a pneumonia and their cultures came back and it was growing MSSA, well, I don't need to use something with really broad coverage if I have a specific drug that really just treats MSSA. So that's where these come into play. So oxacillin, dicloxacillin, and nafcillin are very um, good for that. So if I had someone who's receiving vancomycin for MRSA, which we'll talk about a little bit later, you can then de-escalate here to something like oxacillin, right? Um, same monitoring parameters as all the other penicillins, same renal elimination, all the same stuff here. You can find there's a lot of carryover, a lot of crossover in terms of monitoring adverse effects between all these penicillins here, right? And then we have the anti-pseudomonal penicillin. This is the strongest penicillin you're going to find, um, specifically when you combine it with tazobactam. Notice here it's green all the way down. Really good coverage for all sorts of bacteria here. Um, and so we can use it for things like intra-abdominal infections where you have a lot of anaerobes growing, a lot of gram-negatives growing. This is also the first drug we see here that has anti-pseudomonal activity. So that's another thing you want to underline. So um, if I had a patient who I suspect having pseudomonas, this is a good empiric therapy drug I can use to start off with until I can kind of culture them and find out what they actually have growing. It's a really, really good drug here. However, you don't want to overuse drugs like this because resistance is um, more likely to occur the more you use it. So you have to be really judicious about how you're just, uh, deciding to use these and only use them in, in appropriate cases here. So for instance, if I have someone who has a really severe intra-abdominal infection, like someone who had an appendicitis that perforated and now they're spilling out bacteria into the abdominal cavity and the patient is hypotensive and they're febrile, they're looking really, really sick, this is where this drug comes into play, right? Or they have really bad uh, nosocomial pneumonia, right? This is where this drug comes into play. So typically, more like severely sick patients, ICU patients, things like that, we're gonna bust this out, okay? Um, again, monitoring is going to be exactly the same as all the other things here. Renal function you have to monitor for, again, all, mod modifying how frequently you give it most commonly. Um, still time-dependent killer, still the same mechanism. So you can see, learn to consolidate information such that you don't have to memorize really specific things. Really, the biggest thing you have to know between the different penicillins is the spectrum of covers, like what bacteria it's actually going to cover, because all the monitoring has been the same, all the side effects have been the same. So really, you don't have to spend a whole lot of real estate memorizing each and every one of those things there. If you can at least identify, oh, this drug is a penicillin, I already know how it works, I already know the common monitoring, side effects, et cetera, right? Okay, so those are all the penicillins we talked about. Now we can cross over and start to talk about our cephalosporins. And so cephalosporins are very similar in activity um, to, at least in terms of mechanism, as the penicillins. And that makes sense here because it's still a beta-lactam ring. So the mechanism is identical, but what do you notice? All the side chain stuff is different here, right? So this ring is different than a penicillin, and you'll have different side chains. Now, one of the things that's kind of a common misnomer is that if someone says they have a penicillin allergy, you assume there's enough cross reactivity that you can't use a cephalosporin, right? Because they're, oh, they're both beta lactam antibiotics, so you must have cross reactivity. Uh, Sporn to someone who has an allergy to penicillin. That is false, right? This beta-lactam ring is such a small component of the drug that this is not what your body's reacting to. It's reacting to all this stuff on the side here. And in fact, if you have someone who has a true allergy to penicillin, it's very likely they can receive a cephalosporin. You just maybe want to monitor the first dose they get just to make sure there is no issues there. Is it impossible for someone to have a cross-reactivity? No, it's just very unlikely. Uh, I think the literature reports less than a 1% chance of actual cross-reactivity between a penicillin and a cephalosporin. Now, anytime you ask someone what allergy they have, you gotta ask them what their reaction was. Because if someone says, oh, I got penicillin one time and I got diarrhea, that's not an allergy, right? It's a side effect, it's expected. I don't really care about that. Um, now, if they said, oh, well, my throat swelled up and I had to get intubated, that's a whole other story there, right? That's true anaphylaxis. That's where I'd be maybe a little more cautious. And even then, I'd just do a test dose in the ER, the urgent care, just see how they respond, right? So what do we like about cephalosporins? Well, really good CSF penetration. So we see this used for meningitis quite a bit. Um, you know, the actual monitoring is actually gonna be pretty identical to the um, penicillins. Most of these are gonna be really eliminated as well. There's gonna be one notable exception I'll talk about here in a second. 
Um, and we'll talk about their spectrum of coverage based on the generation of cephalosporin we're talking about. So I'll show you that in just a moment here. And then we'll have a few that actually do cover pseudomonas, which we'll look at in just a few minutes here. So when we talk about cephalosporins, we're going to talk about different generations. And so we'll talk about first, second, third, fourth, and even a little bit of fifth or some, a few newer ones there. Um, in general, what you're going to find is, is that as you go up in the generations, you're going to find better gram-negative coverage. And then in terms of gram-positive coverage, you see it's going to start out high, but then kind of dip down a little bit. And then in terms of fourth generation, it'll start to pick back up. Okay. This is generally speaking, and you're going to see... Um, this kind of bears out in terms of what we're going to use these individual drugs for in just a moment here. So first off, we're going to have our first generation cephalosporins, which makes sense to start out first generation. Um, these, are, again, are going to be workhorse antibiotics. You're going to use these all the time in your clinical practice um, for the most part, depending where you're working at. But if you work in surgery, you're going to use ANCEF all the time. This is what we use most commonly for surgical prophylaxis, meaning we'll give this to a patient right before surgery, usually within an hour. Um, in order to prevent any skin stuff that's growing there to get into the wound and cause infection. Of course, using sterile procedures, and you're going to be disinfecting the patient, but there is still some risk. This is why we give prophylactic antibiotics, right? Eflex, you're going to use it all the time for things like UTIs. Um, you're going to be using it for, um, you know, so I have some um, uh, MSSA coverage. Um, it doesn't cover a wide range of gram negatives, but it covers sort of the more common gram negatives that you would see with something like UTI. It's like E. coli, Proteus, Klebsiella. It gets good enough coverage there. If I had someone who had a history of like resistant UTIs or it, they've had uh, previous courses of antibiotics recently and they have another UTI, this is probably not going to cut it. I probably need to use something a little bit higher generation. Um, but for run-of-the-mill, uncomplicated UTIs, you know, Keflex is totally fine for most patients. Uh, next up with the second generation, you're going to see the gram-negative coverage has now improved. Um, have a few drugs here. We see like cefotetan, cefoxidin, cefuroxime, and cefprazil. Um, I don't see these used as commonly as the first generation, um, but you can see them used for things like you know upper respiratory tract infections, some surgical prophylaxis. You know, used sparingly, but out of all the classes of cephalosporins, this is probably the one I see used least frequently. So. Uh, next, we have our third generation cephalosporins. This includes um, ceftriaxone, ceftazidime, and cefotaxime. Ceftazidime is the first cephalosporin now we've seen that actually has pseudomonal coverage, um, but it's pretty wimpy, so we don't use it for that too commonly. So I wouldn't really spend too much real estate thinking about ceftazidime, other than the fact that it gets really rapid resistance uh, to pseudomonas, and so we don't like it because of that. On the other hand, though, you're going to be using ceftriaxone all the time if you're working in the ER. Um, you know, urgent care, you're going to see this all the time there. Um, some things we like about ceftriaxone, this is the first cephalosporin and probably the only that I can think of that does not require renal elimination, right? Which means you don't have to dose adjust it for um, kidney dysfunction. I can have someone who's on dialysis and I don't change the dose and the frequency of ceftriaxone I'm giving. So that's one really notable exception there, okay? Um, the other thing too is that whereas all of these drugs are still time-dependent killers, I'm giving every 12 hours, 8 hours, 6 hours in some cases, um, ceftriaxone has a really long half-life. And so what that means is I can give it um, every 24 hours and I still get really good coverage there. So that's the reason why people like ceftriaxone so much is because it doesn't require renal dose adjustment and I can give it one time a day for the most part. Um, sometimes you do a Q12 like meningitis, but for the most part, Q24. So very easy to use. Just do Recephin, one gram Q24 and you're done. You don't even have to think about it, right? That's why people use it quite a bit. Um, we also have cefotaxime. This is going to be preferred in the neonatal period. So the first 28 days of life, you're going to be using this as your third generation cephalosporin of choice. The reason for that is, is because you cannot use ceftriaxone in the first 30 days of life. Um, it actually com uh, competes with bilirubin for binding sites on some of the serum proteins. And so you, if you displace that with ceftriaxone in a neonate, you can actually cause pretty severe jaundice, um, hyperbilirubinemia. So you don't want to do that. So um, if they're, you know, say two months old, then get Rosefin, no problem. If they're less than a month, then you use Cefotaxime as an alternative, okay? A few of these you might see used orally um, for like outpatient use would be things like Ceftonir, Cefixime, again, pretty common antibiotics you're gonna run into, especially if like, you know, you're dealing with something to where uh, maybe Keflex would not be a good option. You can then step up your game a little bit and use something like Ceftonir in terms of like good go-to oral sort of um, cephalosporins there, right? Pretty good, pretty common 
they've seen you set of drugs here. You're going to see use, um, you know, if you, if something like Keflex or first generation is just not going to cut it, then you typically, I see a lot of people jump up to the third generation right away. Um, again, you can see here, uh, once a day or seven, I mean, that's just uh, a lot of, um, you know, ease of use is what has sort of propelled Recephin to be used so commonly for a lot of things. A lot of patients who are getting admitted to the hospital, you're going to get put on Recephin you know, if it's for an infectious cause there. Uh, next, we're going to have our fourth generation cephalosporins. This is where we get into cefepime. This is um, sort of the first um, kind of go-to cephalosporin we have here for anti-pseudomonal coverage. And so you can kind of think about Pipercell and Tazobactam or Zosin in sort of the same use cases as cefepime here because they both have good anti-pseudomonal activity. Uh, note, neither of them have MRSA coverage. Um, one other big difference between Zosin and um, Cefepime is that Zosin has really good anaerobic coverage. Cefepime does not. So if I'm not worried about anaerobes, if I'm not dealing with like, gut stuff, um, then this is a good drug to go with. If I do want to use something to cover anaerobes, and I still need to think about covering Pseudomonas, then Zosin is a go-to drug there. But we use Cefepime all the time for really sick patients who have like neutropenic fever, uh, nosocomial infections, pseudomonal infections. Uh, this is going to be a good um, go-to drug in those sort of situations there. All right, so that's all the cephalosporins you're going to run into frequently, or at least the ones I'm going to tell you to, to remember for my testing purposes. Um, next up, we're going to look at the monobactams and the carbapenem. These will be the last set of beta-lactam drugs we're going to look at. Um, again, the monobactams, there's only one drug in this category called astreonam or azactam. You can see the beta-lactam structure right here. Um, this one is really narrow in spectrum. It has good anti-pseudomonal coverage and really good gram-negative coverage, but notice here it doesn't really cover anything else. And so in these cases, if you need that really narrow spectrum of activity, this may be a good drug to go with. Although frequently, um, its main claim to fame for a long time is that they said there's no cross-reactivity between someone who has a really severe penicillin allergy to estranium. The structures are different enough to where there's almost no cr cross-reactivity. However, since nowadays we realize the cephalosporins can be used in most cases safely in patients with a penicillin allergy, um, this drug does not get as much use because it is so narrow in spectrum. But if you had someone who you knew was growing pseudomonas specifically, you could just use this drug by itself and that would be fine. This would not be used for empiric coverage because of the fact that it's so narrow, uh, narrow in spectrum. Yeah. Um, again, monitoring is going to be the same here. Um, you know, renal dose adjustment, watch out for that. Really, you know, the only exception for renal dosing that we've seen so far in the beta lactams has been rocephin and a whole bunch there. Uh, next, we have the carbapenems. Um, so we have imipenem, meropenem, ertapenem, and then doripenem in this category here. Now, if you've noticed that um, the naming conventions for these drugs can be useful in helping you to sort of categorize them. Um, for instance, you know, if you see something with a cillin on the end, you know it's going to be a penicillin, right? You see something start off with CEF or CEPH with CEF, you know it's going to be a cephalosporin. Um, it's handy when drugs fall into that category of naming because that helps you to sort of categorize them in your mind. That's not always going to be the case though. So um, when we talk about things like um, vancomycin, gentamicin, azithromycin, those are all three very different classes of drugs and they all have a very similar naming uh, convention. So that's not always going to carry all the way. Unfortunately, I did not name all these drugs, so I don't really get a whole lot of say in the matter, but that will provide more of a challenge in terms of categorizing them in your mind. So if you can latch on to something like, oh, I know a carbapenem ends in penem, then latch on to that because that's going to help you to categorize this stuff a little bit easier where it's feasible. Now, the carbapenems, I kind of uh, link these to being kind of like a nuclear bomb. Some people call these gorilla psyllin because they are so strong and they kill just about everything. The only thing they really don't get is MRSA. Okay, so if you had someone who could not get Zosin, right? So say someone was on Zosin, but the bacteria comes back and it's resistant to Pipercil and Tazobactam, this is what you step up to. These are also really uh, drugs that we hold on to very closely. We don't like to use them if we don't need to, because if once we lose activity against the carbapenems, there really isn't a beta-lactam to jump up to. There's nothing after this. So this is why you're gonna find that if you were to be working and you order a dose of meropenem on a patient, um, you're probably going to be getting a call either from an infectious disease doc or a pharmacist saying, hey, or why do you need to use this? Are you really sure you need it? Because frequently there's other things we could use first. There's things like Zosin, there's things like uh, Cefepime that you don't need to bust this out unless you really need to. This is like the really good fine dining ware that you don't bust out unless you're having really good company or if you have really bad bacteria trying to treat here, right? 
So very good for that. Very good for multi-drug resistant uh, gram-negative infections. See MDR, that's what that refers to. Good nosocomial coverage. Um, good for meningitis. All that good stuff. Don't bust this out unless you really need it. Now, in terms of um, you know monitoring, all this is going to be the same here. The one notable exception, though, is you want to be really careful in patients receiving imipenem that have poor renal function because if you do not account for that, and modify the dosing frequency and say you're giving uh, someone, you know, every six hour imipenem, the renal function starts to tank and you're not watching that um, and adjusting for it, you can cause seizures, right? Or if you have someone who has a previous seizure history, this could be worsened by that. So this would be something you really want to be watchful for and utilize an alternative if you can, or make sure you're adjusting the dose such that they're not going to um, have the levels build up, okay? All right, so those are all the beta-lactams that we're going to talk about and that you're responsible for for testing purposes, right? Um, we're still covering cell wall active drugs here, so let me get into vancomycin now. So this is kind of um, a different mechanism, different use case that we're going to see for this versus everything else. Notice we've not really covered anything that covers MRSA so far, right? Let's get into vancomycin though, because this is going to be the first drug that actually does cover MRSA. And so this works via a little bit different mechanism. It doesn't do anything with the... Um, penicillin binding proteins. It's not bind to those whatsoever. Instead, it directly binds to those 2D alanines itself and prevents them from forming that cross-link. So by preventing that from happening, again, you disrupt the cell wall. Again, you're going to lead to disruption and leading to leakage out of that bacteria and lead to cell death. That's how vancomycin is going to work. So it bypasses that penicillin binding protein. So it's going to work on bacteria that maybe penicillin doesn't work on. Okay. Also more difficult to develop resistance against this than you would see with maybe some of the more um, kind of early penicillins, for instance. So um, this thing only covers gram positives. That's the only thing it works for. Notably is for MRSA. So if you were to have a patient who had a strong suspicion, I'm bolding this because it's really important you get this, underlining it because it's also very important. Um, this is what you're gonna use if you suspect your patient's MRSA, okay? Now, again, this isn't going to cover anything else the patient might have. So very frequently, you're going to see vancomycin is going to be used for MRSA coverage specifically. And then maybe you add on something like rocephin that's going to get all the other stuff, maybe gram-negative bugs, right? Or if you're worried about anaerobes, maybe you'll look at, you know, zosin plus vancomycin or something like that. It's okay to use those combinations, even though they're both working on the cell wall, because this is specifically going after the MRSA, okay? Now, note... Um, here, vancomycin is only given IV. It has no oral bioavailability. It's never going to get absorbed to the, the GI tract. However, one really notable use for it, which is important here as well, I'm only going to bold this, not bold and underline it, is it's used for C. diff. So I can actually use this orally to treat a C. diff infection. And, and nowadays, we're starting to see so much resistance to the previous gold standard drug for um, C. diff. And now this is becoming first line for adult patients. So oral vancomycin is only good for C. diff. It's not going to treat a systemic infection. Similarly, IV vancomycin is not going to treat C. diff because the concentration in the GI tract are not going to be high enough to kill that. So very important distinction there in terms of how we're going to be administering this. But if you're considering, considering MRSA infection, vancomycin is probably going to be the first line drug you're going to be giving for these patients. Okay. Now, the dosing is really important here. This is another one of those narrow spectrum antibiotics, or uh, not narrow spectrum, it is narrow spectrum and then it only treats gram positives, but um, narrow therapeutic index is what I want to say uh, because of the organ toxicity that can happen if levels are building up. And so this is one of the ones, the most common, uh, one of the most common drugs you're going to be doing therapeutic drug monitoring on. And what you can see here, and I'm not going to ask you this specifically on how often to give the drug based on renal function, but you can see if a patient has really poor renal function, say between you know, 30 and 49 mLs a minute, they're only going to get Q24 hour dosing versus Q8 hour dosing. The reason for that is, is that the levels are building up, building up, building up. You're predisposing the patient to toxicity. And what is that toxicity? Well, the two notable ones here of vancomycin is ototoxicity. I think as levels build up, they can um, deposit there in the hair cells and the cochlea, leading to hearing damage, which can be um, non-reversible and then nephrotoxicity. And again, we said it's renally eliminated. So not only um, do you have to watch the renal function just as a nature of the disease the patient has because you know, they're septic, um, that can lead to nephrotoxicity. Now you have to worry about the drug building of levels and also causing issues. So this is why we have to monitor levels to make sure they're not gonna get uh, too much accumulation and make sure that um, uh, they don't predispose them to some of this toxicity. 
Are penicillin allergies common? Um, not super common. Um, I will say that, you know, for patients, um, I can't give you an exact percentage. It's difficult to tell because a lot of people will say, oh, I have a penicillin allergy. And I'm like, well, what kind of reaction did you have? Uh, and they will say, um, oh, I don't know. My mom just said I got it as a kid and said I can't get it anymore because I have an allergy. So delineating between a legit allergy and not is, is more difficult than you might think. And so it's always really important to ask what reaction do they have? You know, um, was it actually penicillin? Most people just call any, any, any antibiotic they're receiving penicillin. They just call everything that. Um, so it's very difficult to, to discern how often it happens. Legit type 1 anaphylactic allergies, very rare. Very rare for that to actually occur here. Um, so anyway, so when we're doing uh, antibi or, um, vancomycin for a patient here, it's really important that we do that therapeutic drug monitoring. And what we're really looking for is actually going to be trough levels, okay? Now again, just like with the, um, the penicillins, we're gonna see that vancomycin itself is also a time-dependent killer here. So imagine I have the MIC for the bacteria here along this line. What I'm doing for uh, when I'm dosing vancomycin, and again, it takes you know, four to five half-lives to get the steady state. What you're gonna find here is that by the time I get to steady state, I want to make sure, one, that I keep um, the trough above the MIC, right? So that's why I'm checking trough levels. One, for efficacy, but also I want to make sure this trough is not too high because what happens is when you have someone who has um, renal toxicity that occurs, either due to vancomycin or due to some other reason, what you're going to find is, is that, you know, you may be dosing, everything is good, but then, you know, renal function takes a hit and you're continuing to dose it and then you notice that the levels start to climb up, right? So even though the MIC may be here, and this trough level is going to be sufficient to kill that bacteria, as those trough levels get higher and higher, you're predisposing your patient to more odo and nephrotoxicity. So this is why you're going to monitor troughs for both efficacy and for toxicity in patients receiving vancomycin. Okay, that'll be a little different when we talk about uh, another set of drugs here in just a moment. So. Uh, that's what we're monitoring for. Um, one important reaction uh, for vancomycin you want to note is that, you know, a lot of antibiotics I can give over, you know, 30 minutes. I can give over, um, you know, I can give IV push. Many of them are not going to be a problem doing that. However, with vancomycin, you have to give it really slow, and we usually give it over two hours. You know, wow, why, why two hours? The reason for that is because you can have an infusion-related reaction, and we call that red man syndrome which probably isn't the most PC term uh, nowadays, but it's very descriptive for what happens. And basically, if you infuse vancomycin too quickly, you can get um, the sort of infusion reaction where they get like fevers and chills. Um, you can see um, vein irritation. You can see rash that sort of appears all over the body. Um, it looks a lot like a anaphylactic reaction, but it's not. It's just an infusion reaction. If you see this, the only thing you have to do about it is slow it down. Instead of giving over 30 minutes, give it over two hours. And most places have it built in to where it's automatically going to do that. But you may be working in a place that doesn't have those kind of safety features built in. So you just have to slow down the infusion. Okay. Um, again, regards that therapeutic drug monitoring, usually pharmacy services will help out with this. But depending on where you work, you might be the person doing it. So just know what you're looking for there. You're looking for those trough levels for both efficacy and toxicity. Okay. And some patients, you know, we, we may just do random doses, right? The renal function is so poor that we just give a single one-time dose and we keep going back and rechecking to see at what point they, they get to, um, uh, you know, get to a point where we need to redose them. Um, so as an example here, if I had a patient who had um, really poor renal function, um, when, sometimes what I can do for them is just give us, uh, imagine the MIC is here. Sometimes what I can do is just to give a one-time dose and it takes them forever to clear it out. And so what I can do is I can keep checking the levels and check here and say, nope, still too high. I can check here, nope, too high, too high. And then finally, when they get down to the MIC, I can say, okay, now I can redose them. And then I would go ahead and give another dose at that point. So um, different dosing strategies, definitely you have to watch this one because patients can have many issues if they have poor renal or, um, uh, you know, inconsistent renal function, which is more labile. Okay. Uh, here's an example of what that red man syndrome looks like. This has gotten better over time. Um, they used to call vancomycin Mississippi mud, which is probably not a good name for anything I'd want to inject into my body, but um, it used to have a lot of contaminants and look kind of like mud when you were injecting it into a patient. So it's gotten better, a little more pure since then, but this is what a red man syndrome would look like. All right, so those are the main cell wall active drugs. We have the beta-lactams, we have vancomycin. Those are the main ones we're going to run into.
be few exceptions as we go forward, but those are the main ones. Uh, up next, we have our macrolides. Now we're switching over to a different mechanism entirely. The next set of drugs we're going to look at are going to be the protein synthesis inhibitors. Okay, What does that mean? Well, basically, when you have DNA that's been transcribed, then it has to get translated into proteins, right? So you form your RNA, gets transferred over to the ribosomes, and that forms new proteins. What we can do is, by inhibiting this process here, you prevent new proteins from forming, you prevent further function of the cell. Um, note here that whereas with cell wall active drugs like penicillin, we're directly bactericidal, these are bacteriostatic. You've stopped protein production, but you've kind of just slowed things down. It can still function for a little while, um, but it's not going to be able to replicate. So all of these protein synthesis inhibitors, for the most part, there's a few exceptions, are going to be bacteriostatic, okay, versus all the cell wall active ones we've already seen have been bactericidal. Now, I don't care if you know which specific ribosome it binds to. I do want you to know that these are going to be protein synthesis inhibitors. So if you see an aminoglycoside or clindamycin or macolide, you better be able to figure out, okay, the mechanism here is a block protein production and that is going to inhibit bacterial replication, okay? So first one we have here is the macrolides, um, pretty common set of drugs we're going to be using here. The three main ones you run into are going to be erythromycin, clarithromycin, azithromycin. Most people probably heard of a Z-Pak or been on a Z-Pak at some point in their life. Um, very, very commonly used, okay? Now, what's important uh, about these are its coverage here. And so what you can see here, no anaerobic coverage, but it has good gram positive, good gram negative coverage, including MSSA. It does cover that. The other important thing, though, is that it covers atypical bacteria. So for older patients, maybe like an adult patient who has a pneumonia, their risk for getting something like mycoplasma or even something like chlam uh, chlamydophila uh, is higher. And so in those cases there, you may choose to use an antibiotic that has atypical coverage. And so typically the macrolides would be your first stop here. It's going to be the most common um, set of drugs here that will cover atypical bugs like Legionella, Mycoplasma, etc. So this is one of the main use cases for it. So this is an important thing to note with the macrolides, atypical coverage. And remember, that's another kind of buzz word you want to think about. Again, no good anaerobic coverage here, but if I have someone who has an ammonia or if they have an upper respiratory tract infection where I'm strongly suspecting um, an atypical bug, or if they can't receive like something like a penicillin, like H. influenza, Mark uh, cataralis, that's where these are going to be used here. So you see these used for a lot of upper respiratory tract infections and a lot of lower respiratory tract infections. Which you can see here just off this list. Um, also, you may see it used occasionally for some other bacteria that are not super common. So, for instance, like Mycobacterium avium complex. This is something you would see just in patients who have really poor immune systems, like really kind of late stage um, AIDS, for instance. You would see this more commonly being used for prophylaxis to try to prevent the infection from happening. You know, healthy individuals with a competent immune system can run into MAC all the time and not have any issues with it because they have a good immune system to fight that off. But if you don't, and this is where we can sometimes provide prophylaxis there. Um, you see azithromycin being used for things like chlamydia, uh, and sometimes you use it for H. pylori. This is important for um, causing a lot of peptic ulcers, and so we'll learn about that in the GI section coming up later on in the class. In terms of adverse effects, you're going to see that the GI is a little more common. Now, you can say nausea, vomiting, diarrhea for any drug, right? Any drug out there in the world has probably caused nausea, vomiting, diarrhea at some point in their time. Not super useful here. Uh, however, some drugs are more likely to do it than others, and so this isn't going to be one of those cases here. The macrolides tend to have a pro-motility effect on the GI tract, and that has to do with their ability to actually interact with uh, motilin receptors in the GI tract, and motilin will stimulate peristalsis. That can be a good thing. We can actually use it, and I have a lot of uh, patients on the PEDS side of things who get erythromycin. If they have uh, poor motility issues in the GI tract, they'll help to stimulate peristalsis and move things along. So it can be both a side effect and a therapeutic utility, right? You can use it for that. Um, other things to want you want to watch out for include things like cholestatic hepatitis. This is not as common, but there's certain salt forms of erythromycin. You can sometimes see this. Um, transient hearing loss. This is less common because we don't use a lot of IV macrolides, but that could be something you would see there. Um, however, this is a really important point here. I want you to kind of put a put a uh, you know, emphasis on this one, because anytime we come up to drugs that prolong the QT interval, you want to be, have that in the back of your mind, because this is a potentially um, fatal complication. It's something that a lot of practitioners don't think about. And most of the time, when if you're using 
these drugs by themselves, it's not going to be an issue. But there's some patients who are really high risk for having this happen, and there are some patients who are multiple drugs that do this where you run into problems, and that's QT prolongation. QT prolongation, which we'll look at on the EKG in just a moment here, um, is a side effect you can see with certain medications here, um, more common than you might think. And then the risk is that they can cause this uh, ventricular arrhythmia called torsades. Torsades to points, uh, it's a French term, means twisting of the points. It's a very particular ventricular arrhythmia. It's very different than a lot of other ones. This is going to be more common in patients who have a congenitally prolonged QT, which some patients have is rare, or if they're on multiple medications that can prolong the QT interval. They can interact with one another and lead them to have a higher risk for torsades. So what happens here? Well, basically, I'm not going to get into the entire cardiac cycle because that's going to be in our cardiology section later on. Basically, it prolongs the repolarization period in the ventricles and does that by preventing potassium efflux out of the cell in the myocytes. So what that looks like here is instead of having a normal ventricular repolarization happen like this, it gets prolonged. This red line is a prolonged QT. What that looks like on the EKG, which you have a normal you know, sort of sinus rhythm here. Um, now it's been prolonged here. Now what that does is it causes um, some changes in refractory periods in some of these cells and that predisposes you to this arrhythmia, which you can see here. Notice how it's kind of twisting the points. That's what it looks like. It's very particular if you see that. Now, it can be really difficult to treat arrhythmia, and if you ever want the treatment of choice, this is something you should lock into your brain because you're going to get acids on rotations. You'll see this on the pants. The treatment of choice for torsades is magnesium. Magnesium sulfate IV is going to be the treatment of choice for torsades if you see this. So the thing we can do, though, as practitioners is to make sure that we're monitoring. If we have patients on multiple drugs to prolong the QT, you can go ahead and make sure you're monitoring the EKG to make sure there's not going to be an issue there. Okay. The other big thing you're going to see with the uh, macrolides that cause SIP interactions pretty commonly. So uh, more so the erythromycin followed by clarithromycin and azithromycin, these inhibit CYP3A4. So if there are patients are on other drugs that are metabolized by CYP3A4, you're gonna see those levels go up and that's gonna predispose you to toxicity. So always, always, always check the drug profile prior to prescribing because you don't wanna cause one of these interactions and cause some big issues. All right. Up next, we have the tetracyclines, and this includes, uh, it kind of makes sense to call tetracyclines because they have four rings here. It includes uh, tetracycline itself, doxycycline, and then minocycline. These are also going to be protein synthesis inhibitors. Just like the um, macrolides, these are also going to be bacteriostatic. Um, benefits, so these are pretty broad spectrum. So you can see these being used for all sorts of things. Uh, DC anaerobic coverage, uh, these are used frequently for a lot of like animal borne diseases, like. Uh, uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever and Lyme disease, um, good activity against those. So you'll see these for a lot of things. Um, if there's ever like a bioterrorism attack of a bacterial origin, tetracyclines tend to work for a lot of those things there as well as like things like Yersinia pestis, cause a black plague, things like that. Um, doesn't cover pseudomonas, no C. diff coverage. Um, but here's another one here, and if you notice, covers MRSA, so that is notable. Um, could use it for like a skin and soft tissue infection. And actually, you can find the tetracycline used pretty commonly for um, acne. It's actually one of the common uses we'll see. We cover derm a little bit later. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but anyway, so you're going to see these used pretty commonly for things like atypical pneumonias because they do provide atypical coverage. Uh, animal borne diseases, S STIs, is the newer nomenclature. However, you're like, okay, well, these drugs look pretty good. Why don't we use them for everything? Well, there are some limitations to it, mostly due to the adverse effects. Uh, so, for instance, there are a lot of drug interactions here, and they chelate with cations. What that means is they actually bind um, to certain things in the GI tract. So things like iron and calcium is important because if you are taking tetracyclines along with, like, say, milk, for instance, like older patients might, um, they will bind one another up and then prevent them from being absorbed. So it means the tetracycline never gets absorbed and thus is never going to be able to treat that infection, right? So you got that. Uh, it tends to bind to calcium in the body as well, which can lead to discoloration um, of the teeth. And, and that is more important in patients who have actively developing teeth. So like an adult patient, this is not going to be a problem. Um, if you had someone who's like less than eight who is on this for like maybe a couple of weeks, um, that could lead to some issues there. So uh, definitely want to avoid that in kids less than eight, uh, unless you have a really specific indication to use it for them. 
but that can also have some issues in terms of affecting uh, skeletal growth. So we actually prevent uh, or uh, make sure we don't give this to women in the second and third trimester because it can affect the skeletal growth of the fetus there. So we might make sure we avoid that in those uh, particular, particular type of patients. Um, these also have to be renally dose suggested. The macrolides don't, but these do. So you want to watch that in terms of renal function. Kind of uh, cousin to the tetracyclines is this glycyl cyclin, and there's only one drug in this category, and that's called tigacyclin or tigacil. Um, I kind of like it because it kind of looks like a tiger a little bit. So if you notice, here's a little tail on it, and here's a little legs, and uh, if you use your imagination a little bit, um, you can see that. It actually makes sense because if you look at all the marketing, uh, it always has a tiger in it. It's like a bright orange color, so kind of kind of neat. Um, this is good. It's kind of like a, a, a ramped up version of a, a tetracycline um, used for things like MRSA, used for more um, resistant bacteria. This is more like an ICU kind of med. If, um, you know, uh, other bacteria or other antibiotics have become resistant. Um, so we'll save this for those type of cases there. So if we have someone who has like a really complicated intra-abdominal infection or something, you can kind of bust this out and that is, is pretty useful there. Um, pretty good agent though. Um, not a whole lot in terms of like adverse reactions or side effects to really worry about other than the normal uh, sort of stuff there. Uh, up next, we have the aminoglycosides. Uh, there's going to be three in this category here, including amicacin, gentamicin, and then tobramycin. Um, again, some of the naming conventions are not going to be super um, intuitive. You know, vancomycin versus gentamicin are very different um, in terms of their activity. So aminoglycosides, um, whereas you had uh, vancomycin was like very narrow spectrum just for gram positives, aminoglycosides are very sp uh, specific for gram negatives, right? Um, you can kind of think about as trinam has similar coverage to the aminoglycosides as what we saw before, the only gram negative coverage here. Um, this includes pseudomonas coverage. So this is going to be one of the first line drugs you're going to be using for pseudomonas. Now, the thing with pseudomonas is that because resistance is pretty common and we want to make sure that we get a drug that's going to be treating that infection, oftentimes what we'll do is double coverage. So if you're suspecting pseudomonas, sometimes we'll double cover for it, which is not common and not good practice to do generally. Um, but because the risk of harm that pseudomonas can do, sometimes we do that. And this is where it's important to make sure you have different mechanisms here. So... It's not uncommon if I had someone coming in from like a nursing home and I had high suspicion of both MRSA and pseudomonas, I could put them on vancomycin for the MRSA and then I would have two different drugs to cover pseudomonas. And I want to make sure I use two complementary mechanisms. So I can use a cell wall active drug like cefepim for pseudomonas and then I can use a second drug and this is frequently where the amino glycosides come into play because these are protein synthesis inhibitors. These actually are bactericidal not sure why that is specifically versus other protein synthesis inhibitors, but these are, and this will also cover it. So I have a protein synthesis inhibitor and a cell wall active drug that can work against pseudomonas. That's synergy by using those two different mechanisms. You don't want to use meropenem plus zosin because those are two cell wall active drugs. That's not going to provide you any additional benefit. Okay. So kind of keep that in your mind in terms of how these are working together. So very good for that. Um, this is going to be a, a good example of a concentration dependent killer. And so this is going to be a case here where we're actually using Q24 hour dosing very commonly in order to make sure that we get really high levels to kill off the bacteria. Um, and then we also can make sure we're not going to accumulate any drug there. So what this would look like uh, in this case here, if we were using an amino glycoside, and this is another one that has a narrow therapeutic index. Uh, so we want to make sure you're monitoring for levels here as well. Um, so now it's like vancomycin and amino glycoside are the main ones we've looked at using levels. So previously what we would do with... Um, the amino glycosides before we understood what we know now is we would use Q20, uh, Q8 hour dosing. And so you'd have to sit here and make sure that the levels were high enough to kill the bacteria, but also the level, the troughs were not so uh, high that it was going to cause toxicity, right? So you'd measure the top here, the tr uh, peak for efficacy, and then you measure the trough for toxicity, right? So you have to measure these two levels um, and make sure that they were in the right range. Nowadays, we go with a different strategy. We realize that it has that post-antibiotic effect and it is a very good concentration-dependent killer. So now I do Q24 hour dosing. And so instead what I do is, oops, what I do is I can give one really big dose one time a day that gets really high level. And then we'll gradually go down throughout the day, right? And then here's your next dose will be given at 24 hour mark. So let's say here's 24, right? Apologize, I'm writing with my right hand on a mouse. Um, so what does it do for us? Well, basically, 
one, we know this peak is going to be high enough to kill that bacteria. Like, there's no way it's not based off the dose we're giving the patient. So we don't actually have to measure the peaks here. We don't really care because we know it's going to be high, right, which is good. Um, however, we do monitor the trough still. We always still want to make sure that the patient is getting a trough done because it should be undetectable at this point, which is good because that means that the body has cleared it. If we were to have a patient with poor renal function and we were to give a dose, uh, that Q24 hour dosing here, and they were to do it, but they couldn't clear it as well. And we found that their level was, say, here, the 24-hour mark. This would be too high, and that's going to predispose us to some toxicities, which I'll talk about in a second here. So for the Q24-hour dosing, we're doing uh, aminoglycosides. We're measuring troughs specifically for toxicity purposes, right? Because we don't care about the troughs for efficacy with a concentration of any killer. This is in direct contrast with vancomycin where we did care about the troughs because that was really important to make sure it was above that MIC for efficacy. So go back and review that because that will be an important concept to delineate between why we're doing levels for these particular uh, antibiotics, right? Anyway, the toxicity we're really worried about though is pretty similar to vancomycin in which we're worried about renal toxicity and then ototoxicity. And so these two are used in combination, vanco and, and the amino glycosides. Um, together and again these can be synergistic in terms of toxicity is why it's so important to make sure you're monitoring those levels appropriately okay um, again here measuring for troughs make sure levels are not too high um, those are basically the things we're kind of looking at always make sure that you are um, giving the patient enough doses to get the steady state before you check levels i see a lot of practitioners try to get too early those levels are not going to be reflective of what it is like a steady state remember it takes four to five half-lives to get to steady state Okay, um, so uh, a couple of random ones here. We have uh, two in this category called linazolin and daptomycin. These are actually two uh, very different mechanisms, but we're going to find that they uh, are used in similar situations. So linazolin here, or Zyvox, is going to be this uh, one here. It fits into the protein synthesis inhibitor category, um, but this is used for really resistant gram-positive bacteria. So if you had something that was resistant to vancomycin, like MRSA or enterococcus or something like that, this is where you're gonna bust out Zyvox. Does not work for gram negatives, no anaerobic coverage, just for really resistant gram positives. Now, um, you know, so you're gonna use it as like for healthcare acquired pneumonias or community acquired MRSA. This is where you're gonna use this. It's not gonna be a first line drug. This is where vancomycin maybe has failed, or if a patient could not tolerate vancomycin, this is where you're gonna bust out Zyvox for that. Um, Note the toxicities here can cause some thrombocytopenia, so bleeding risk could be there. Um, also, this is going to interact with anything that affects serotonin. We're going to talk more about this when we get into uh, the behavioral health section later on, uh, I think next semester. But uh, basically, any drug that increases levels of serotonin, like many of your antidepressant drugs, can interact with Zyvox to cause what we call serotonin syndrome. I'll talk more about that later, but just know that um, this is not a combination you want to have happen here. You got to be watchful for it because it can cause a lot of side effects on the patient. So. Just be aware of Zyvox interacts with serotonergic drugs, SSRI specifically. So like your um, Prozacs and your Paxils and your um, Telexas and Lexapros, all of that stuff can interact together and cause serotonin syndrome. We'll get more into the details later. So again, useful for uh, vancomycin-resistant enterococcus, uh, vancomycin-resistant staph aureus, all really good for that. You can use Zyvox there. Now, um, Daptomycin is kind of an interesting one because this has sort of a unique sort of mechanism. This actually can cause depolarization of the bacterial cell wall, kind of disrupts the DNA, RNA. It's kind of like, um, you know, like movies when they do like an EMP pulse and it disrupts all your electronics. I, I kind of think about daptomycin doing that for the bacterial cell. It just kind of disrupts the whole thing and, and kills it off. Um, very good drug. Um, only issue is, is that you can't use it in pneumonias, right? The actual surfactant in the lungs disrupts daptomycin and prevents it from being useful. So if you ever have like a, a um, you know, a soon, or I'm sorry, MRSA uh, pneumonia, this would never be good for that. But if you had a skin infection, if you had uh, bacteremia, daptomycin is totally fine. And again, similarly, both of these we're going to hold off on using until we have documented resistance to vancomycin because once you get resistant to these two, there's not really anything else you go to, right? Nothing else. The other big thing with daptomycin is you have to monitor for things like myalgias and to measure the CPK. CPK, for those of you who don't know, um, somebody told me it was California Pizza Kitchen. Not in this case here, unfortunately. Um, but CPK is uh, creatine phosphokinase and is um, something that is released from the muscle when it starts to break down. So you can actually cause rhabdomyolysis in patients due to muscle breakdown, due to daptomycin, similarly disrupting the muscles, causing depolarization 
uh, to occur there. So you got to watch out for that. Um, this could be a reason to stop the medication entirely if they do have significant muscle breakdown. So um, only about five minutes left. I don't know if I can get through all the fluoroquinolones. So I think I'm going to cut it off there. Hope you guys are still with me. Uh, not a lot of chat, but that's okay. If you have questions, though, feel free to post them up. Let me check the sticky board real quick. Let's see. Um, so said, do we need to memorize a cockroft gall equation for exam or rather just have an understanding of what changes in each variable mean for creatinine clearance? Um, yes, very specifically know what's changing in terms of the variables and what effect that's going to have on the creatinine clearance. So for instance, um, if you have an older patient, that's going to have an effect on your creatinine clearance. You know, someone who is 90 is unlikely to have as good a kidney function as someone who is 60. Okay. Um, know that serum creatinine is that goes up that's going to cause the creatinine clearance to go down, right? And have an understanding of why that is. Because if the kidneys are not filtering the creatinine and getting rid of it, then more of it's sticking around the blood and you're going to measure it. So that means they're not filtering it, getting rid of it, then they're not fun functioning as well. And so as serum creatinine goes up, kidney function is going down, right? Those are the big things to kind of have the, the understanding on there. What other questions do you guys have me about the test tomorrow or about, I want to give you enough time have any questions there speak now or forever hold your peace or I guess type now or forever hold your peace so anyway so if you're um, confused about any of the topics we covered in terms of the antibiotics feel free to check out um, check out that reading that I posted uh, in the week's uh, contents there um, if you have a hard time reading it, there's the link uh, to it as well, which you can find on the document and it can take you back to it. But um, handy, quick guide that, you know, maybe hearing it through a different voice might be useful. Um, some graphs in there too, they can kind of illustrate the points we're talking about in terms of like, what do I mean by when I say concentration versus time dependent and, you know, bacteria static versus cytokine and all that sort of stuff there. So just another way to, to, to view it. But um, otherwise, if you guys have any questions, um that's it you can you can head out i uh, hope you have a good week i'll uh review the test tomorrow after it's finished see if there's any give backs and all that good stuff and then um i'll post up an announcement if there's any like high miss questions i'll typically will post um you know some points on that you know if there's like a common thing that most people got wrong you know i can go ahead and you know kind of uh further clarify that um otherwise you should be should be good to go i think it'll be a good test remember a lot of it's um this test will be pretty different than future tests because this one focuses so much on sort of the fundamentals. Um, so, you know, know your definitions, understand the concepts that we covered in terms of like the kinetics and all that good stuff. Um, you know, in terms of the hematologic drugs that we talked about, that's where we're, this is going to be more consistent with kind of what we're going to see going forward. So like know your mechanisms, know um, common drug interactions no sort of the common adverse effects i mean i can guarantee you for every drug we covered in um in the hematology section bleeding was probably going to be the number one risk right so you should be familiar with that um contraindications right so if someone already has a bleeding risk perhaps maybe you shouldn't give them more things that cause them to bleed um you know understand drug interactions like warfarin for instance um you know why you might use um you know, direct thrombin inhibitor versus heparin, you know, um, you know things like that. Um, you know, there are big points I can think of. Those are not the only ones, but those are kind of things I'm just kind of thinking of coming to mind um, right off the bat here. But otherwise, you're free to go. You can leave. Uh, I'll, I'll stay on for a minute or two to see if anyone else has questions. Hopefully that um, the drawings were helpful with some of the graphs and whatnot. I'm trying to announce some new stuff here in terms of my uh, transitions and, and things like that. But uh yeah, have a great week and, and good luck on the test. I think you all do well and uh, I'll see y'all see y'all later. Everyone's sticking around because I don't know if someone's going to ask a question or not. If you have questions uh, for me via email, um, get them to me as soon as possible because the later it gets in the day, the less likely I am to respond. <laughs>
Uh, let's see, Maria uh, is asking, or Mariah uh, is asking, uh, can you go over first order clearance specifically with a chart about amount of body and body amount eliminating fraction limit? Yeah. So with first order kinetics, remember that it's always the same proportion of drug being eliminated per unit of time, right? So if I were to go back and draw it out. So if we were to look at that, you can see here if I was to graph out drug concentration versus time, um, the higher the level is, the more drug you're in just a milligram amount you're gonna be eliminating that same amount of time because of the fact that it's always the same percentage, right? So if it's 15%, it's always 15%. If it's 50%, it's always 50%, right? And so what that looks like, if you're just to look at a normal kind of time curve, is you're gonna see here, you get that kind of, this nice curve here where the, the higher the amount of drug is in the system, the more drug you're metabolizing and then as levels get down lower and lower, you're gonna get be metabolizing less and less. It's still the same proportion though. And so what you, and then finding then is that you can figure out what the half-life is, right? So the time it takes to get from, you know, say 50 milligrams per liter to 25 is gonna be the same amount of time as it takes to get from 25 milligrams per liter to 12 and a half, right? It's always consistent in that ways. And that's what allows us to do those kinetic calculations and what allows us to get the steady state and things like that, right? So if I were to have something that were to just have zero order kinetics, where it's always the same amount of drug per unit of time, if I were to plot that out, it would just be a straight diagonal line, right? Or straight as I can make it. Um, so the it's always the same amount. It doesn't matter if I'm up here or if I'm down here at the bottom, it's always the same amount of drug per unit of time. And this isn't helpful for us in terms of like kinetics in a lot of cases there because of the fact um, that you don't get the same sort of steady state um, levels like you do with the first order kinetics, which is why it's good that most of our drugs do follow first order kinetics for the most part. Um, so that's the thing there. First order kinetics is the same percentage of drug per unit of time, same proportion of drug, and then for zero order kinetics, the same amount. Actual milligram amounts gonna be the same. So like I mentioned with alcohol, 20 milligrams per deciliter about one drink per hour is how people metabolize alcohol. So if I keep stacking drugs or alcohol on top of that, it's still gonna be the same amount they're metabolizing every single hour. So that's why it takes sometimes people hours and hours and hours to get sober. If they've had, you know, six, eight drinks or something like that versus if they only have one drink, it's just one hour. Versus like a first order kinetic drug, um, you know, if they do have a ton of drug all at the same time, um, you're gonna see you're also metabolizing a ton of that at the same time because that proportion, that percentage is still the same whether you're at a very high level or a very low level. It's just that when you're at very low levels, that percentage is a much smaller milligram amount versus if you're at a very high level. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but the only reason why we have a steady half-life is due to the first order kinetics there. If you have any further questions on that, feel free to post it up. Oh, it's funny, I can't see myself when I do that. Maybe you guys don't want to see me. But there I am. Still playing with my uh, my streaming setup here, so... Eventually I want to become a, a star for doing Minecraft or something. We'll see if I get there. I am almost at 500 subscribers though, on my YouTube channel, so that's pretty good. Nothing else. Everyone just stick around just in case. Again, ask your questions. I don't want anyone to feel silly for asking a question or uh, uh, I don't like to use the term stupid. I don't think it's a very useful term, but um, you know, I never, my intention is never make anyone feel bad about asking questions here because you're all here to learn. Uh, so fans ask, is it just a six map mainly that can cause an allergic reaction in some cases the entire GP uh, 2B3A? Good question. Yeah, so um, any drug can cause allergy, right? So that's always a, a baseline risk for any particular drug. Um, you tend to find that the risk is higher anytime you're using a protein-based drug, right? Um, so like insulin is a higher risk because insulin itself is a protein, but you know the stuff we use is pretty close to looking like human protein, so it's not so bad. But a monoclonal antibody is an, uh, a protein that we have designed um, specifically to, to 
hit a certain target, right? And so in this case here, we designed antibody to affect the 2B3A receptor itself. And so because it's a foreign protein we're injecting to the patient that and carries higher risk for that occurring, just like um, you know, old school like um, snake antivenom was made from horse proteins. And that was like notorious for causing a lot of cases of anaphylaxis. Um, but um, as you get uh, either smaller proteins or if you get stuff that looks more human, the more human it looks, the um, less uh, likely it is to have a reaction. And what's actually interesting too, let me see if I can pull this up. Monoclonal uh, antibody comparison. Let's see if I can find one of these images here to show you. Yeah, so let me pull this up. Um, so if you're looking at this picture here, um, what's interesting is this is what it would look like if you had a, a monoclonal antibody of various types. And if you have something called chimeric, that means that it actually has um, a little bit of both human protein and some other type of protein, usually murine, which stands for mouse, right? Murine means mouse. And so if you have something that looks totally human, your body is much more tolerant of that because it mimics what your body naturally produces. Um, as you get into more uh, foreign protein, so if, for instance here, this is a chimeric has more mouse protein, your, your risk for anaphylaxis goes up because unless you're treating a mouse, uh, your, your patient's body does not recognize that as, as natural or as, uh, you know, as, as a, it recognizes as a foreign invader basically. Um, versus if you use something that's entirely murine, so if you hear um, if it ends with the OMAB, that means it's uh, more murine protein and your body's much more likely to have a reaction to that versus something that's chimeric. So abcixamab, the X-I-M-A-B means chimeric. It's kind of makes sense if you kind of cross you know, the X, it's a cross between human and murine protein. So just a little interesting point there. Again, this is pharmacy. It's not the most exciting topic, so we got to find interesting things wherever we can. So that's a very subjective sort of term. It's always keep an eye out for MAB. That's an important suffix for a particular drug. We'll have more uh, cases of that in the future. Good. Glad that makes sense. Okay, well, I'm going to end the stream here. Um, thanks for joining me. And if you have any questions, like I said, please email me before, well, too late. Um, I'll probably be in bed around 11 or 12, so before then for sure. If it's after that, it's all on you. Uh, thanks, and I will see you later.